Next, we turn our attention to the study of phase diagrams. Phase diagrams are really an important part of the synthesis of solid-state materials. So if we know what the phase diagram is, then we can use that to plan our synthesis. We can decide what synthesis temperature would be appropriate. We can use phase diagrams to help us grow single crystals if that's desired. So in this lecture, we're just going to talk about the simplest sort of phase diagrams where we have no compound formation. And we'll follow that up with a lecture where we now introduce intermediate compositions between the end members. So let's start with the Gibbs phase rule, which is stated here. And the Gibbs phase rule tells us that the degrees of freedom, that is the number of variables that we can change and keep the same mixture, is equal to C, the number of components, plus 2 minus P, the number of phases. Now, in this class, we are almost always dealing with condensed phase systems, and we can simplify this if we talk about just one atmosphere pressure. In that case, the degrees of freedom equals the number of components plus 1 minus the number of phases present at equilibrium. Let's look at a very familiar phase diagram to any chemist. That would be the phase diagram of water. And we can apply the Gibbs phase rule in the following way. So here we have a one component system. Water is the only component present. So if we apply the Gibbs phase rule, it tells us that C equals one plus two, so that's three, minus the number of phases equals the degrees of freedom. So the degrees of freedom cannot be less than zero. So what we see is nowhere on the phase diagram can we have more than three phases at equilibrium. The place where we do have three phases in equilibrium, the triple point, so the number of phases equal three, and the degrees of freedom equal zero. We cannot move off of this point in any way without disturbing the equilibrium. The opposite extreme might be, say, somewhere over here in the solid phase. Here we have only one phase present, and so the degrees of freedom becomes 3 minus 1. There are two degrees of freedom. And indeed, we can change either the pressure or the temperature independently and still maintain just the solid phase as the equilibrium phase that's present. Now, if we happen to be at a phase transition, let's say on this line, the melting line between solid water and liquid water. There we have two phases present at equilibrium, and so the degrees of freedom must be one. We could change the pressure, but if we do change the pressure, that means the temperature has to change in a specific way to stay on the line. So we only have really one degree of freedom. We cannot independently change the pressure and the temperature and remain at a point on the phase diagram where the solid and liquid phase are in equilibrium with each other. Now, what does this look like when we go to a condensed system? And here we're going to take what is arguably the simplest of phase diagrams for a simple system. We now have two components, A and B. You could think about these as elements if you want. Maybe A is copper and B is palladium. Or, as we'll see later, we might think about them as um, compounds. So we'll see later phase diagrams like calcium oxide and magnesium oxide, which can be treated as a pseudo-binary system. So in this phase diagram, the composition is changing along the x-axis. So on the far left-hand side, we have only component A. And on the far right-hand side, only component B. And then the y-axis represents temperature we are assuming here that we are at atmospheric pressure. You could have, of course, a phase diagram where the pressure is also varying, but that would require a three-dimensional plot to represent it. Now, how many phases are present in each of these regions? Well, the phase rule is stated here, and because there are two components, we can say that the degrees of freedom is three minus the number of phases. I've given a link to a YouTube lecture from the University of Colorado Boulder that talks about how the phase rule applies. Here, I'm just going to give you the short implications. 
In a two-component phase diagram, in any given region, we will never have more than two components. And at any given point, we cannot have more than three phases present at equilibrium, right? The degrees of freedom cannot go below zero. What do we see in this phase diagram? Well, we have this gray region at high temperature, which represents a liquid phase. That is a homogeneous single phase mixture. Its composition can vary, and the temperature can vary, and we still have this homogeneous liquid. So up here we have two degrees of freedom. And then we have three other regions where we have two different phases in equilibrium with each other. Right? We didn't see this in the water phase diagram because there's only one component. But in two component phase diagrams, we typically will have some regions of the phase diagram where there are two phases in equilibrium with each other. This rectangular box at the bottom, both A and B are solids. In these other regions above this line, which we'll see is called the solidus, we have a solid phase in equilibrium with a liquid phase. And then there's one place in the phase diagram, right here at this point, where the liquid, solid A and solid B, all three are in equilibrium with each other. And that point is called a eutectic point. And in this kind of eutectic phase diagram, the eutectic point also represents the minimum in the melting point. It's winter in Ohio right now, and it's common that when you have a snowstorm coming through, uh, the city or the state or the county will put salt on the roads. And the idea of that is that on the phase diagram between salt and water, as you add salt, it lowers uh, the melting point. Okay, And so that's typical that there is a certain mixture called a eutectic mixture which has the minimum melting point. Now, there's a couple other vocabulary features to learn here. This horizontal line that's drawn here is called the solidus. And the solidus represents the highest temperature at which no liquid phases are present. Below the solidus, we have two-phase mixture of solids. And above the solidus, we have a two-phase mixture of a solid in equilibrium with a the liquid. Then we have this curve line, which separates the pure liquid region from the rest of the phase diagram we call the liquidus. Okay, let's take a random point on this phase diagram. Here we pick a point A, which on the x-axis corresponds to point 6. So the composition at this point is A.4, B.6. And at high enough temperature, we are going to have a homogeneous liquid. Let's examine what happens as we cool down from this temperature. When we reach the liquidus line, at that point, the liquid is in equilibrium with solid B. What happens if we cool a little bit further? So if we cool down to point C, now we're in a two-phase region. So we're going to have an equilibrium mixture of B plus the liquid. But the liquid is going to have a different composition than it had at point B. So one of the rules for using phase diagrams is if you're in a two-phase region and you want to know what is the composition of the phases that are in equilibrium at that point, we're going to draw horizontal lines until we get to a single-phase region. Here, the line that goes to the left, point D, that is the liquid. And if we were to go downward from point D, we would find that the composition of the liquid is now approximately 45% B and 55% A. Of course, the line, if we go to the right, goes all the way to pure B before it intersects a single phase. So if we go to point C, we have an equilibrium mixture of a liquid that, quoting the uh, stoichiometry a little bit more carefully, A.57, B.43, that liquid is in equilibrium with the solid B. The overall composition, though, still has to be 60% B. So we can work out the mole fraction of these two phases. And to do that, we're going to use something called the lever rule. 
we're just going to look at the lengths of the different segments on this line from D to E. So the mole fraction of B is going to be given by the length of the line opposite to B, that is the length of the line DC, divided by the length of the entire line DE. If we could get values from the x-axis here, we started at point 6, and that's the coordinates of this point C, and so the length of the line from C to D is 0.6 minus 0.43. The length of the line in total from D to E is 1 minus 0.43. So if we do the math here, we come up with a mole fraction for the solid B of 30%. So at point C, we have a mixture of 70% liquid and a 30% of solid B. Let's apply just a little bit of common sense reasoning. The closer this point C gets to point D, that means the sample must be increasingly mostly liquid and not very much of the solid. And so that's why we're using the opposite side of the lever to calculate the mole fraction of this component. I'll leave as an exercise for you the calculation as follows. If you were to think about a sample that's 30% pure B, and 70% a liquid which has this composition A.57B.43. When you add those two things together, you'll find that the overall composition is still 60% B and 40% A. I mean, it has to be because we're not changing the overall composition of the sample. It's just segregating differently into these two phases. Here's a real-life example of this kind of simple eutactic phase diagram. Here we're looking at the world of silicate minerals, and we have two such minerals, diopside and anorthite. Apparently these minerals are found in lava flows. Um, if you were to cool on this side of the phase diagram, as soon as you cross the liquidus, you start to crystallize out diopside, and only when you pass the solidus do you start to crystallize anorthite. Whereas if we were to shift over to the right-hand side of the phase diagram, we would see the opposite behavior. Cooling from the liquid, we would initially start to crystallize a northite once we cross the liquidus, and it would only be that we see crystals of diopside forming once we cross the solidus. Okay, let's look now at a different kind of a phase diagram. In this phase diagram, the solids form what's called a solid solution. Remember, a solution means a homogeneous mixture. That's what liquids oftentimes are. That's what gases always are. Well, solids can also form a homogeneous mixture. So you get that in, say, something like silver and gold. They both have a cubic close-packed structure, and you can mix any ratio of silver to gold together, and you just have a random distribution of the silver and gold atoms in the lattice. Now, you might think, okay, I have a sample that's 65% silver and 35% gold, and I expect that I'll heat it up, and at some point it'll just melt. But it's a little bit more complicated than that, and let's walk through what happens when we take such a solid, let's say at point G, which is about 65% of component B, and 35% of component A. Now, at that point, we have a homogeneous solid solution. If we were to heat that up, when we get to point marked Fs here, which is at temperature T2, the sample will begin to melt. But it's not going to melt homogeneously. Let's go up in temperature a little bit to temperature T3. Let's say that corresponds at this point E. And at that point, we have an equilibrium mixture of a liquid, which has the composition right here where this point intersects the liquidus. And if we were to come down, that might be something like 0.47. So it's 47% of B and 53% of A. It's definitely rich in A. The part of the sample that's still solid, on the other hand, has a composition that's very much rich in B. So we would come over here, and then we would come down, and we would say, okay, the solid must have a composition that's 83% B and only 17% A. And as we continue to heat, 
once we pass point D at temperature T4, the sample would melt entirely, and we're going to go back to a homogeneous composition, liquid, that has the composition of 35% A and 65% B. Here's an example from real life. Once again, we go to the world of silicate minerals. And here we're looking at the phase diagram between Forsterite, Mg2SiO4, and Phaolite, which is Fe2SiO4. So notice that both of these compounds have the same stoichiometry. They also have the same structure, the olivine structure. Olivine is a structure we haven't mentioned, but remember when we talked about spinel, we said spinel is a cubic close packing of oxygen ions with magnesium ions going to one-eighth of the tetrahedral holes and aluminum ions going to one-half of the octahedral holes. Olivine has the same filling of the holes, but now we have a hexagonal close packing of the anion. This is an example of two compounds that form a complete solid solution and have a very simple phase diagram. Now, we can also get solid solution formation, but it's an incomplete solid solution formation. In this phase diagram, when we're below the solidus, we have a mixture of two solids, here denoted ASS and BSS. So they're not pure A and B, but instead they are these solid solutions. And the composition of the solid solutions we can get from the phase diagram. So if we were to start at point G, okay, and let's say that the coordinates of the points given here, D is point 1, and G is at point 3, and H is at point 9,5. We might ask ourselves, what phases are present at point G? And then what's the ratio of those two phases? So let's pause the video for a minute. Uh, you can work through that. And then we'll go over the answers. So the starting point to answer this question is, since we are in a two-phase region, if we want to know what two phases are in equilibrium with each other, we're going to draw horizontal lines until we come to a single-phase region. So here, if we go to the left from point G, uh, eventually we come to this shaded gray region, which is a homogeneous solid solution. And so if we were to draw a vertical line here, we would see that it is located at x equals 0.1. And so what that tells us is one of the phases present there is not pure A, but it's a solid solution that's 90% A and 10% B. If we draw a horizontal line in the other direction, we can see that the other phase present is going to have a composition that's 95% B and 5% A. So at point G, we have a mixture of these two phases. Now, we could use the lever rule to determine what is the ratio of these two phases. Let's do that. So let's try and figure out what is the mole fraction of this phase that's very much rich in B, this phase that we encounter at point H. So the fraction of that phase is going to be the length of the segment GD divided by the length of the entire segment DH. Plugging in the numbers, we come up with a phase fraction of 24%. So that sample is going to be 24% of the phase that's rich in B, 95% B, 5% A, and it's going to be 76% the phase that's rich in A. Here's an example from real life of a two-component phase diagram where we have some solid solution on the end members. This is a magnesium oxide and calcium oxide. Interestingly here, both take the rock salt structure, and you might think that you could form a complete solid solution from one end to the other, but in fact, if you were to try and make something at a mole fraction of 50%, you'd end up with two kinds of crystals. One uh, set of crystals is going to be very rich in magnesium oxide, but have a little bit of calcium dissolved into the magnesium oxide structure. And the other phase is going to be very rich in calcium oxide, 
with a little bit of magnesium present. And when we find this two-phase region separating two parts of the phase diagram where we have a solid solution, that's oftentimes called a miscibility gap. Right? You think about liquids that are immiscible, like oil and water, it means that they don't mix. Well, here, it turns out that magnesium oxide and calcium oxide do not mix very well. They mix a little bit, but not very much, and so we get a miscibility gap. 